Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me here for what I am going to be calling The Ride So Far. This is going to be an explanation of what our adventurers went through when we were still playing privately before we started to record for your viewing pleasure. <clears throat> I A lot of games that start recording mid-story, uh, at least the ones that I've seen, they they leave out this part. They they kind of just catch you up on the story as they're going, and you, you hear details later on that the players have written down in their notes or whatever. So I figured I would get ahead of the curve a little bit, and I would get you guys the full backlog of things that you missed, or at least the major plot points of everything that's happened. Um, I will also be going over things like uh, the world so far, a world overview of things that you guys may not know from what you've seen from us playing and um, some of the details my players might have missed so if they give this video a watch too they'll be getting all that information back also i'll also at the end go over some of the things that i've that i've homebrewed and some rules that are were homebrewing and all of those things for all you rule sticklers out there that are going to call me out of my bullshit um just so you're aware of some of those things that being said, why don't we jump into a little bit of background on all of our, our heroes and the things they've done pre-cast. As most adventuring parties meet, our, our group was uh, an event of happenstance. All of them, through various means, had heard rumors that the town of Nightstone was having trouble with giant attacks. So, they head to Nightstone. Meeting along the road, some showing up at various intervals as the town is attacked by goblins and orcs and uh, gang members and all of these various things that are, for whatever reason, trying to come and turn Nightstone into their own personal haven. While in Nightstone, our lovely group of adventurers, uh, all of Lysander and still with our dear friend Morzir, um, rather lacking Lysander, to make it more clear, um, have decided to help the people of Nightstone. They have, they've learned that the, the villagers of Nightstone themselves are holed up in a cave that is being guarded by other goblins, and a few trolls, and some other things. And they get all this information from who would then become a dear, dear friend to the party, a goblin by the name of Gum Gum. With a nat 20 roll from our dearest, lovely god roller, Garagak, played by Coda. Uh, our group of heroes recruits Gum Gum to their adventuring party. He joins up with them, no questions asked. All he, all he wants in return is his own portion of the pay. Our group of heroes goes to the cave to save the villagers of Nightstone, and, well, honestly, terror ensues. In this fight, our dear hero Garagak goes down in the fight and is seemingly dead. No way of returning. After dealing with some bats that were attracted to sound and, um... Gum Gum, after not being a member of the party for long, getting demolished by an ooze somewhere in the cave... A mysterious figure appears to the party seemingly having watched them. This is the introduction of our party to Dandelion. Dandelion, at the time, is, as far as the adventurers are concerned, a member of a secret organization called Xerxes. We'll get into the details of Xerxes later. He tells the party that they are going to do amazing things. They are, they are destined for greatness. Um... They are going to help change the world. And he asks them to support Xerxes in their cause in helping the giants to do whatever they need to do to bring the Ordning back into their power. Again, we'll go into what the Ordning is later. Um, the, the giants themselves uh, seem to be collecting various pieces of an ancient siege weapon that they had used to beat off the dragons in the to fend off the dragons in the giant dragon war that happened thousands of years ago on the storm coast now dandelion 
makes a very solid case. And just to to reaffirm the options of you can either support Xerxes and myself, and good things will happen, Dandelion brings Garagak back to life. And in a show of force and a, a threat of if you do not work with us, what could happen to you, Garagak, uh, or rather Dandelion, having just brought Garagak back, drives his rapier straight through the throat of Morzir, our dear friend Zack, who now plays Tumult's first character. Morzir being slain and laying dead on the ground, Dandelion vanishes from sight, leaves our, leaves our heroes questioning and wondering what comes next for them. After leaving the cave, our group of lovely heroes meet a Furbolg paladin by the name of Lysander and continue on their travels. But not before recruiting, again, from a very lucky role and my inability to say no to my players, a lovely orc by the name of Soup, who becomes a very dear friend to the party as they travel. Our group of adventurers then meets up with a uh, cloud giant by the name of Zephyros, who regales them with the fact that they are the prophesized ones, that they are to dictate the world of the future, much like Dandelion had explained to them previously, and gives them virtually no information, but leaves them with a token that they can use to summon him should they ever have questions or need something answered. He, he, he has in his tower a very vast library full of various odds and ends and books describing all of his memories and all of the knowledge he has acquired over the years. The group catches a ride with uh, Zephyros towards the town of Waterdeep, this massive city that exists outside of the uh, uh, outside of the harm and horror of Nightstone, their first trip to civilization to really solidify who they are and get a reprieve from all of the ridiculous few days they've had thus far. In the town of Waterdeep, they have their first obligatory beach episode, and um, through convincing a town guard that partying and building sandcastles is more important than doing his job, uh, they re recruit said town guard, a lovely, lovely human by the name of Phil. Phil and Soup now have joined the adventuring party, and... Also, while in Waterdeep, they meet Tumult, the lovely, lovely character played by Zack. Again, if you guys don't know who these characters are, you should really watch the series. It'll explain a lot of this stuff to you. Now, upon leaving Waterdeep, the party heads to Goldenfields. Goldenfields is a town that they have heard rumors of on their travels that is apparently having some issues with giants. The town itself surrounds a shrine that is built to um, honor some of the gods of nature themselves. This, this totem, this shrine in the center of Golden Fields is the reason that they can grow such fertile... They, they can use this ground to grow an abundance of food that is eventually traded to the rest of the Storm Coast. It is a major food supplier for the rest of the area. And while our party is there, they are indeed besieged by a group of giants. Hill giants, to be specific. These hill giants, they take almost nothing from the town of Golden Fields during their siege. Our party fights valiantly, but the giants seemingly ignore them and all rush to the shrine in the center of the area. Temp Bard valiantly does everything that they can to defend this shrine, but ultimately is unsuccessful. Um, the party, having fought their hardest against various other foes that have entered the fray, uh, goblins and bugbears and uh, orcs and, and various other beings have all attacked the town of Golden Fields at once, seemingly as a distraction for the giants to take this shrine. After taking the shrine... Temp Bard uses a, a magical set of paints they have found in their journeys to paint a new shrine, a new, a new tree that immediately fills with this deitic power that this shrine once had. 
after the attack... Golden Fields is in shambles. The fields are burning. The walls are destroyed. It seems like Golden Fields is gone for good. Most of the villagers laying slain. And then a miracle comes. A group of druids appearing virtually out of nowhere comes and starts using their very powerful natural magic to rebuild the town of Golden Fields. To bring life back they indeed bring back to life all of the people that had been slain in this attack our dear Anuk, a druid himself is indeed given a boon by one of these druids in the form of a a picture of a of a lotus flower tattoo um as the group is thanking these druids for what they've done um, a dandelion grows out of the ground just to drive home the fact that Xerxes was good. Xerxes wanted to help the small folk. Um, again, we'll get into the details of Xerxes and what they're looking for later. The party, after saving Golden Fields, goes on a various barrage of side quests, going and turning in various things, dropping people off at various locations, as you do in these games. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you all and regale you with each and every beautiful action that these people take. But on their journeys, they come across a tower. An old stone tower being circled by bloodhawks. Very vulture-like creatures that are seemingly waiting for a kill. Inside of this tower is where they meet Moog. Moog is a hill giant woman that uh, has been through a lot in her life. The party tries to connect with her, and they do variously. Temp Bard, being who Temp Bard is, obviously tries to sleep with Moog. Moog seems uninterested in Temp Bard, but is very heavily drawn to our dear Tapartos. The rest of the group leaves Tapartos and Moog to have some silent conversation, and Moog reveals to Tapartos that the Ordning may not be exactly what the party seems to be thinking it is at this point under dandelion's guidance moog reveals that at one point um, her and her late husband were trying to bring all of the giants together to work for peace instead of war to work together with the small folk and with the dragons and any other race they wanted to see a world full of peace and they were making progress it is also revealed that zephyros the friendly cloud giant that they had met previously was in fact the father of Moog's late husband. Through a various cavalcade of chaos and a very romantic kiss shared between Tapartos and Moog, Tapartos agrees to help Moog to try and restore this peaceful ordning that her and her late husband had been working so desperately towards. And she tells them that when they're ready to assault Groodhog, which is the, the hill giant fortress where the current chief of the hill giants lives, she will be there to help. But first, they needed to gather more allies. They needed to become stronger. And the last bit of direction that Moog gives to Tapartos is that he cannot tell his friends anything about this plan until they were ready and he knew they could trust them. Our group of adventurers leaves this tower, continues on their various side questing, and follows up on a rumor that they had heard about a dragon living in the Crypt Garden Forest known as Old Gnawbones. Our party decides to go and try to find Old Gnawbones and see if they can recruit her to their side or get answers about what the giants may be trying to build upon having a conversation and being pulled into this game of truths the heroes reveal some troubling things um, some of their life goals uh, some of the things that they've been hiding from the rest of the party but also, and probably the most surprising thing, they learn that Ivan's true goal in life is to take over hell. 
It seems pertinent that you guys have this information. Old Nawbones, after they complete this trial of truths, decides to offer her aid to this group of adventurers, seeing as they are the only ones trying to bring peace. Dandelion, however, is ever vigilant and all knowing. So the party, dis- uh, as the party is finishing up their time with Old Nawbones, Old Nawbones lets them know that their friends are in grave danger. Upon leaving this forest and going back to where they had left Soup and Phil to defend their carts and all their possessions, they realize that Soup and Phil and most of their horses have all been slain. Anuk and Ivan take off in a rage-filled chase trying to find out the the, the reasoning and, and, and the, the people that have done this to their poor friends. And they come across a group of barbarians that they realize and are informed that worship the giants like gods and they will do anything for them and they will they will provide them with any service they require to be treated as an equal with these people or even as an underling. The group then returns together to hear the sultry tones of Dandelion's voice from behind them, essentially informing them that it was all their fault that Soup and Phil had died, that he could have intervened. He watched it all happen, but he chose not to because the group had assuredly decided not to work with him anymore. Gave them an ultimatum and said, you can either choose to support me, or if you act out against me again, I will consider you an enemy, and as and so will Xerxes. The group is heartbroken, torn up, and Dandelion offers them that as a show of good faith, should they agree to continue helping him and instead of stabbing him in the back and betraying him, as he put it, will bring Soup and Phil back to life. The group, besides Tapartos, agrees. From there... The group is kind of at a loss of where to go next or what to do. Through some various antics involving decks of many things and some other chaos, our group finds themselves walking next to a river, seeing Dandelion ahead of them. Most of the group, everyone except for Departo, of course, decides that they should go and investigate and see what's going on, and this is their first interaction with a creature they would later come to uh, meet again, known as Lion Dandy. Lion Dandy is a seemingly off-kilter cartoon clone of the man Dandelion himself. After completing a very, very, very complicated combat, our group reaps the benefits of their choices. In Lion Dandy's place, as he is slain, appears a chest. Inside of this chest is a very old, fossilized, uh, seemingly made of like fossilized amber and stone-carved chain links, is an ancient symbol of Sylvanus. Also in this chest is a very old book that they couldn't seem to identify, and the same with an empty ink bottle and a quill. And a necklace of fireballs that Tempard, for whatever reason, very much so emotionally clings to. The group continues on their travels and try to make sense of what's going on. They sit outside of a town of Westbridge for a while and... This is when Tapartos decides that he can trust the party and comes clean about everything that Moog had told him. The group, at this moment, decides that they need to speak with Zephyros, who, to see if he remembers anything about his... well, his long-lost child. Tapartos, of course, knowing from Moog's information, and I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but I will make sure I mention it now, uh, uh, Moog has informed Tapartos that... 
Zephyros has indeed lost all of his memories from the past, and the only things that he can remember now are the things that are written in the books he keeps in his tower. They decide, as a collective, that the next step in their journey is to talk to Zephyros. So, they use the coin, the one that Zephyros had given them what seems to be forever ago. This is when things get a little bit haywire. Lysander, looking up at the mountains, just just west of where they had uh, been on the road when they used this coin, sees that, in fact, a large doorway has appeared on the side of this mountain face. They go and investigate this door, the only, one, the only person that can see it still being Lysander. Lysander leads them into this door and... They find themselves in a demiplane. A small clearing of trees inside, very overgrown with lush vegetation, and a cave. They enter the cave, and this is where they meet Barry the Blind, an old, undead beholder that, well, nearly kills the entire party, but succeeds in turning uh, turning to Partos into a statue, petrifying him for what would have been an eternity. But the other thing that they find inside of this lovely cave is an ancient shield with a slot in the front that seems to be the exact shape and size of this ancient holy symbol of Sylvanus that Lysander has found. When the symbol is placed into the shield, it, it glows with this bright, vivid green light that shoots out of the shield like the outside ring of an, a nuclear explosion. It covers the entirety of the Prime Material Plane, it seems. And it heals all of, his, all of their party members back to full health. Even Zapartos, who had been turned to stone, is freed from his statuesque ending. Upon exiting this demiplane, the group sees that the entirety of the area around them, and as far as they can see, is now filled with just trees and greenery and new vegetation. It's like the whole world has sprung into life again. That that all of, all of the things that have gone wrong in this area, as far as Plants dying and not being taken care of and all of those things, anything that a nature god would fix or deem worthy to fix, are fixed. This is when they look up and see Zephyros' tower approaching. This is where our true story begins. I know my retelling is a little bit rough and I'm, I'm missing over points and I'm sure my players are going to yell at me for switching something around here and there, but I thought it important to hit you with all of the good story points. Now, let's get into some of the details of the surrounding world and the world overview, shall we? Namely, some things like the Ordning and what that is and Xerxes and who they are. Let's start with the Ordning. The Ordning is a very ancient ruling system for the giant race. It essentially pairs giants down into tiers of, of level of like royalty, nobility, and leadership based on how strong they are. The Allfather, the giant god, dictates which tribe of giants, be it hill or cloud or storm, is at the top of the ordning, and they are the rulers of all other giant tribes that fall beneath them. However, where our story has begun, very recently the Ordning has fallen apart. Without the Allfather's guidance to choose new leaders as time has gone on, the Ordning is no more. All of the giant, all of the giant tribes, the hill giants, the, the fire giants, the frost giants, all of them are working to try and somehow take the top spot of the Ordning whenever it is returned to them whenever whenever the Allfather deems one of them worthy to lead. 
all of them are going about this in various ways. Uh, the the cloud giants are assuming that whoever holds the most knowledge will be the ones chosen to be at the top of the ordning. The uh, the hill giants think whoever is the largest giant will be the ones to take over the ordning. Various giants of various ways. Our party has not really learned much about other than the hill giants, really. Um, and this is where Moog and Xerxes come in. Moog is trying to reinstate the Ordning in a way that will bring peace to the giants and the small folk and try to unite everyone to where they will work together in harmony instead of constantly being at war. Xerxes wishes to see the giants succeed in tearing each other apart, in tearing apart everything that giants consider an enemy besides small folk, of course. They... Xerxes wishes to see this siege weapon that the giants are trying to recreate as part of reassigning the the, uh, the ordning. They want to see it completed. They want Xerxes wants to see this this siege weapon brought to finish off the entire dragon race. And then, after this war, to go in and clean up all other monstrous races that exist. In the world, everything that is not a base humanoid deserves to be slaughtered, and this is Xerxes' viewpoint of the world. Now, Xerxes. Xerxes is a secret organization that our party has, through various information sources and research, figured out is a society that has shown up throughout history. Any time a world-changing event has happened, Xerxes has been there playing a part of it and trying to dictate how those large changes are going to take place in themselves, how they're, how they're going to best benefit Xerxes, and thus, at least in Xerxes' eyes, benefit the rest of the small folk kind. Xerxes themselves the group has learned nothing about, at least apart from base descriptions. They don't know any of their members besides Dandelion. They don't know anything, really, about Xerxes at all. Now, there's a few other things I want to go over, and I know this is, I know this is not the most exciting thing to watch, and I know the outer quality is bad, but hey, we're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, I just want to bring this story to you in the best way that I know how, and that is um, retelling it to the best of my ability. The last thing that I want to go over, and I mentioned it briefly earlier, is that I want to go over the things that I have changed about this world, and, and the rules that I have changed, and some things like that. Um, just for if you want to watch, you'll know these things. If not, that's all the story points we're most likely going to cover in this video. So... You're free to stop watching at this point to go over to episode one and start your journey with us from there. Now, rules changes, things like that. Um, for any of you that have played Storm King's Thunder to this point, you can see that everything that I have just said is completely insane and it goes against what Storm King's Thunder is and how it's played and all of those things. Um, and you're right. I have essentially taken Storm King's Thunder's map because it looks cool and the the ordning and some of the characters and I've taken them and completely torn up the base design and re-put it together like a badly misformed jigsaw puzzle. I've added secret societies, I've added political intrigue, I've added all sorts of different NPCs and characters and, and all of these... Well, to be honest, ridiculous things, cartoons, and anything that I can think of that'll make my players have a really fun experience, because that's the goal of D&D. &D. I want this story to be as interesting for my players and for you guys as possible, so that's what we strive for. Now, if you have any questions, please comment on, here, on this video, and I will jump back in and I'll answer them, or if there's anything that you, you feel like you didn't get enough information on, let me know and maybe I can do a part two. But, for now, let's stick to what we know, okay? As far as rules that I have changed, um, one thing that I use very differently than basically any other DM that I've ever met, played for, or watched, is that I give DM inspiration and give the ability to use DM inspiration very differently than in the base book and how it's described. I have a very big policy of rewarding 
my players for being creative or going above and beyond in their role play um, or doing the weekly recaps instead of me for, for, for staying on task and taking good notes and things like that. Um, that being said, my players are not capped to one point of DM inspiration at any given time. They have a collective total that they can pool together. If they never use it, they can gather as many as they want. I don't care. Now, the other thing that has changed is what they are used for. It is no longer just granting an advantage on a die roll or anything like that. It is they can use DM inspiration points for a few things. One, they can use it to automatically critically succeed or have someone critically fail on any given ability check, saving throw, attack roll, whatever. They can also use it to get a helpful hint on a puzzle or to help them figure out some sort of problem that they're having and get a little bit of extra wisdom or insight into the the actual situation themselves. Um, most of the time, our players use it on each other. They don't use it on themselves. They're, they'll If there's a really important role for somebody for a big role play story thing, they'll use DM inspiration for that or whatever. And that's the whole point. That's the reason that I have so many of them floating around is because it helps push the story in the way that my players want the, want the story to go. And that's all I could ever ask for is I want them to have fun, and if I can facilitate that, that's what I'm going to do. On that note, there are a few things that I do differently than a few other DMs too, and probably the ones you're used to, um, at least if you run like some some very, very rules-heavy uh, campaigns. Um, I will always default to the rule of cool, and for those of you that don't know what the rule of cool is, it is essentially... Um, not an actual written rule anywhere what the rule of cool is is if somebody does a super cool thing or has a really creative idea even if it's not within the realms of what their abilities could do or what the base of a base description of a spell says or the effects of the spell if they describe it well if they're creative with it that is absolutely amazing i will have them roll whatever skill checks or whatever i deem necessary but in general I want my players to be as creative as possible because it helps build a better story. And as I've said a million times so far, it feels like that's what's most important is building a really good story. Now, there's one other thing that I should mention, and it's 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 not important. It doesn't really affect you guys at home, but I, I feel it's important to, to make sure you understand is that I don't generally say no as a DM. I play in a sandbox style of way and i run games in a sandbox style of way so whatever decisions my party makes are their decisions to make they can say screw you and screw everything that you've set up here we want to get on a ship and we want to sail to an entirely different continent and start start over fresh and that would be great my players could do that that's that's just how i dm not everybody's like that and that's okay but that's what i do so if if, if it ever feels like i'm being too lax or if it feels like I'm, I'm letting my players get away with too much. That's why. I want them to have fun. I want the story to be as entertaining as possible for not just you guys watching, but for us. We do this because we enjoy it, and if we lose that joy, then we're not going to want to do it anymore. But anyways, I think you've had enough of me blabbing now about nothing and forever, and we all know you guys aren't here to watch me. You guys are here to watch my players and watch the awesome characters they've made and do all of these things. So, that... I think is an apt way, a napped time, to end the ride so far. Please, I hope you are enjoying anything you've seen so far, and if you haven't watched a, a full episode yet, or watched us actually get in and dig deep and play some D&D, I highly encourage you to do so. My players are the most amazing people on the planet, and they are the most creative people on the planet, and they do a phenomenal job. I could not be happier to be a part of this with them. So, thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of a rest a, wonder, a wonderful rest of your life. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your life and that that is a long amount of time. I'll work on my closings in the future, I swear. Bye everybody. <laughs>